Okay, so welcome back to our course in Cyber Physical Systems. Today we're going to start Chapter 3, uh, specifically on Cyber Physical Systems. So every, um, every course has like that main chapter that kind of tries to embody what the main theme of the course is about. And before that, we have a couple of uh, sort of um, introductory or fundamental type chapters. So we had that with systems and embedded systems. And then usually after this sort of pinnacle chapter, you go on to some supporting examples, case studies type of uh, chapters. And we're going to have that too when we look at things like uh, Internet of Things, and uh, pervasive computing um, and the role of systems in software engineering in cyber physical systems as well as uh, industry 4.0. So this is kind of uh, the main chapter of the course, the, the meat of the course, what the course is about. And it's, um, it's, it's twice as long as the previous, uh, any of the previous two chapters. And uh, but I think towards the end, it goes faster because we do have a lot of examples of to kind of explore how this technology is being utilized to a certain extent, but when it does really take off, how we see the world evolving using this type of uh, technology. So first, we're going to go through sort of the actual definition of what a cyber physical system is, although we have been alluding to it uh, throughout the previous two chapters. And then we're going to look at a combination of what are the challenges, uh, what are the recommendations of the people that have been thinking about this, about how to tackle this, um, putting together this type of complex systems in the context of what the requirements are. And then, we're, like I said, we're going to look at a bunch of applications. Uh, a couple of them are going to be a smart cities and the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything, the Industrial Internet of Things, which are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but we're going to go through different subject domains and see how cyber physical systems and that type of complex advanced technology is being used and how it can be used more and better. So what is exactly, how do we define a cyber physical system? So it's really an evolution of an embedded system, but an embedded system that has much more stringent requirements than the ones that are widely used at this point. Those requirements, because they couple tightly with the physical world, and when I talk about the physical world, I don't mean necessarily external things. Of course, all systems interact with external things, but I really mean coupled. The, the, your physical world is not necessarily predictable or nice to model, then that brings very stringent real-time requirements. So the system has to be able to react to that interaction with the physical world. The other part is that the system has stringent requirements for being robust, for being uh, safe, and as it does what it needs to do. And safety, we're not just talking about making it safe for users and for humans and the environment, but also from a cybersecurity perspective, because we're going to see that an aspect of these systems is the connectivity of it. So, there are such systems 
these days. So we are sort of working toward a massive proliferation of these types of complex systems, connected systems. Most of the, the embedded systems, they are sort of operating in a very well-bounded environment. And they are not necessarily uh, massively connected. So that's a distinction between cyber physical system and just embedded systems. So we hope that we're hoping that with this chapter um, we can go through that is strategic foundation to um, to get you started with cyber physical systems. So when things get to to academia, of course, it's being it's being talked about for a for a while. Uh, so how this, did all this start? So back in 2006, so in the context of bringing a technology to wide adoption and really creating a market, it takes, this is not a, a long time. So in 2006, the National Science Foundation, which is the main uh, funding body for academic research and more, but certainly for academic research, identify what they coined as cyber physical systems as one of the promising research themes of the future. So there are uh, well-renowned academics uh, that serve in different committees and committees come, come up with, we're being given this money uh, by Congress, how do we allocate it? And people apply for grants, universities apply for grants, professors, and if we have a good idea within this, the themes that they're asking for, then we get, we get money, we get grants. So after that, there is, a, there is a, something called PCAST, which is the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So this is a council of the many advising bodies that advise the office of, uh, of the President of the United States. Uh, advised that that program was uh, funded and established. So first, uh, there were 65 projects that were funded for a total of um, about $60 million. Now, after that, the same um, advising body, PCAST, uh, it recommended that the program got extended. So after, that was in 2010, uh, <clears throat> through uh, 2013, and 30 additional million dollars were allocated to research in this, um, in this field. So, and I'll tell you later what happened as an, uh, uh, as an outcome of that research here in the United States, because there is a contrast at this, um, about the same time that the program was being extended, around 2012, a uh, study was published by the German Academy of Science and Engineering, so they have also their own bodies, and this was on the topic of information and communication technologies because at that point they, they were tying that report to the, the trend of Internet of Things. So it was starting to be um, talked about. And they determined that there were opportunities and challenges uh, in a related trend, which by that time was well known as cyber physical systems. So, and they, they went further to articulate that cyber physical systems was going to touch all areas of societal infrastructure. Uh, and it would play a central role in any type of technological breakthrough such that it could bring about a lot of new business opportunities. Because what countries are trying to do is to foster the economy through business opportunities. So they 
they looked at that uh, not before the United States, uh, but a little bit after, in parallel when the, the United States was funding the second round of the research through NSF. So uh, there were two, Germany and the United States, looking at this, this issue. And the outcomes and the conclusions are what are interesting and uh, contrasting. So they both allocated funding. Um, they both allocated funding, but in the United States, the funding was more allocated to the development of the underlying technologies. So the conclusion was that what we need is more technology. In Germany, it was a little bit different. The conclusion was that the challenges was not going to be in the available technologies so much, but in the methodologies, in the methodologies to be able to take advantages of the technologies to put together the complex systems. So that's a, there is a distinction there. The United States was looking at how do we develop the fundamental technologies and advance that, but in Germany, they were looking at if we have all this great technology and we are going to gainfully employ them in these complex systems, how do we get that done? Because there are no good methodologies. You can come up with that first prototype, but eventually bringing up the product to market uh, at a cost, on budget, uh, on time, that's a whole different thing. And there are no methodologies to make sure that things are designed in such a way that that follow through can happen um, from a business perspective. So I happen to agree with the German approach because I see every day a lot of, the, I, I'm very familiar with a lot of great technology. And the challenge that I see every day is how to put together this from a project perspective to come up with a product. So why does this happen? Why, why is that cyber physical systems present such a, um, such a challenge. So, do you know the answer? The answer is the complexity. We, we have been talking about that um, because they go beyond that traditional uh, embedded system, such as you know automation, a system that may be used in a, uh, in a factory, in a closed type of environment. Uh, and they go beyond that and they require close networking, so connectivity, and also networking of different disciplines. The, the fact of being very heterogeneous, which we discussed um, in the previous chapter in the context of embedded systems, but now is a magnitude, that property of being heterogeneous is a magnitude higher. So if you have a um, traditional automation system, for example, in a factory, it may be connected through a, what is called profit bus. This is it's an industrial automation bus, it's a standard, and it stands for process field bus, and you can connect different instruments and machinery in your factory. And you can perhaps connect it to um, a master controller or a control room, and control can, can happen. Now, on the other hand, a cyber physical system is going to be using open networks and protocols, such as the internet. Uh, so the internet is this vast abstraction which you can get to it in many different ways. So, that is a big, a big difference. Um, 
the type of connectivity and openness in, in terms of the complexity that you can and interactions that you can put together, as well as how open, because you're connected to many things, uh, being subject to threats, threats of um, cybersecurity nature. And also, if you're doing a lot, sort of the system has a lot of responsibility, then the consequences from a safety perspective can be dire as well. So there is a lot more uh, at stake in riding on this on these systems. So as part of this, we're talking about the Internet of Things, which is um, so the idea is that everything is connected because it's so inexpensive. Like we said, the technology is there to connect all kinds of things. Uh, that convergence of communication uh, actually makes that the importance of cyber physical systems, since we have the underlying technologies and we have the possibility of making these systems, the question is, how do we make them? And they become important because they can really solve problems. When we go through the uh, examples and the case studies later in this chapter, you'll see all the possibilities in all areas, many areas, uh, which are going, we're going to explore. So these systems really go beyond the traditional embedded systems, and they go beyond the traditional communication systems. So it's, it emerges those two worlds and then it also merges with the physical world as well, including humans. So there lies the complexity. <clears throat> there lies the complexity. So what type of paradigms um, would be employed? A couple of uh, paradigms what we're going to be calling ambient intelligence, which means that there are so many electronic devices in the room, in the environment, and they can be sensitive, they can be sensing, they can be collecting data, they can be doing computation. And this, this devices, they can, work together, they can be connected together to what? To enhance the life of people. That ultimately, that's what we want to do, enhance the life of society, the way that we do things, the way that kids play, the way that we go about our work and our productivity, and the way that we have fun. So it's all about increasing the quality of life. That's important. That's the, the, the um, overarching, the overarching um, goal of a society is to increase the quality of life of the citizens. So the Internet of Things is part of that, of that massive connection of different devices. At the same time, that pervasive computing is going to be part of that effort as well. Because now, everything is a computer. There is so much computer capacity right now in the world, and all of it is underutilized. Because we don't have the methodology to make these devices collaborate and shift load from one to, uh, to another. We know how to do it in very well-structured systems. We know how to have server farm and distribute load across a server farm. We know how to have a network of workstations and distribute load different jobs across the network. But all these different systems, how do we harness the power that they have so that we have this pervasive computing um, infrastructure? And because everything is a computer, then you have what is called a disappearing computer because it blends into the environment. It's everywhere. 
and everything could be potentially a computing device. So only what you're going to be getting about is that human-machine interface, the interface uh, with the system, whatever that is. So <clears throat> the idea of pervasive computing uh, is that we're going to be computing with everything and everywhere. And because things are connected, we can be using any device at any location in the format. We're going to have the capability of communication so the format of computation can vary, but we can get the results that we need. If you look at the the market for PC, if it's not declining, sometimes it looks like it's declining and, and then it flattens out, uh, but it's definitely not a growth area. PCs, including, um, including laptops, including all the, um, the Apple type um, genetic computing platforms, None of that is growing. So society and business people, they are like, well, what is the next growth opportunity? And companies uh, respond to that. So these are, this is a big part of the next growth opportunities. Internet of things, cyber physical systems that use that paradigm. Those type of systems, which are actual products, because Internet of Things is a paradigm, is a way of achieving something. It's not really a product. You say it's a started as a trend. You can call it a mega trend because everybody is talking about it, but it's not a product. It's a way of achieving something. And it's one of the contributors contributors to this cyber physical systems. These are the products. The cyber physical systems are the products that are going to employ paradigms as such as the Internet of Things. And that's what's growing. So there lies the, the opportunities and the challenges. Because right now, uh, more than 98% of all computing devices are not PCs. Are not PCs, are not Macs, or MacBooks, or laptops. Uh, and they are virtually all connected, uh, well, they're increasingly being connected to the physical world and the internet, which is the cyber part. Uh, but from that perspective, from the connectivity, is, is also very small. So the idea is that as we increase the connectivity of these systems in equipments, different gadgets and, and products, we get this massive global network of devices. Then we get this massive global network of devices, which are really made of complex hardware and software interacting with the physical world and connected. So those kind of like the, the four pillars of cyber physical systems. Hardware, software, interaction with the physical world, networked. And they'd be able to do a lot of interesting, provide a lot of different, uh, a lot of interesting services and make up for a lot of uh, great products, which we're going again to be looking towards the, um, looking at them towards the second part of the, the chapter. So all this, um, all this evolution because it's really an evolution of the classic embedded system to be able to process all this data and make it available then to the network. 
can really have an impact then on devices that can act as actuators. So, deviating a little bit from the slide here, one thing that I'm very interested in and that I'm fascinated by is the concept of predictive maintenance in complex systems. So, if you could predict when something is going to fail or when it's better to maintain it in a proactive nature rather than through a just a routine maintenance schedule, if we could do that, uh, the reliability and the robustness of products would be greater. But how do you do that? Well, you will have to have sensors assessing the state of the system, but then how do you know when something is about to go? How do you address that fussy logic and, and the nature of that problem? Well, one way to do it is to use data beyond the system that you are looking at and trying to network with the same type of same types of systems somewhere else and trying to look at that data as well. Because the more data you have, then you can assess better and learn more, and then you can make that determination better. So we, that's, that's, that's something better. That's, some, that's a better approach than what we have now. Very rigid maintenance on a schedule, and if something goes in between, well, then it broke. That, those are the different ways of um, addressing problems that we're going to have an opportunity to have because everything is going to be connected or have the potential of being connected uh, to the network. So all kinds of sensors um, and sensor networks or sub-networks, uh, actuators, actuator uh, networks or sub-networks. And then if we have all this data and all these devices and platforms available to us, one of the challenges, and we're going to go through several of them later on, is how do we address uh, or come up with the algorithms to make use of all this infrastructure, all this capability, while we address things like interoperability, and of course, in that sense, what is the right or ergonomic um, HMI, the, the human machine interface. What is the right uh, way of interfacing with humans? So that's another area that is really um, where changes can come about, very interesting changes for the better. So we know that integrating embedded systems with the physical world, tightly coupled, um, that's what we mean by cyber physical systems, or partially. In a cyber physical system, we're going to have these embedded computers and network monitor and process physical processes with feedback loops, and then through actuators, the physical processes are going to affect the computation and vice versa that computation is going to affect that physical process. So that's going to be a loop. And the reason we're highlighting that now is that that close interaction is going to necessitate a deep understanding of the electronics and engineering domain, but also a deep understanding of those um, physical processes which may, may or may not have to do anything with electrical computer engineering. Uh, it could be another discipline of engineering. It may not be engineering at all. So bringing back what we talked about in the first chapter about domain experts. That's why the domain experts are going to be so important. So this is uh, kind of give you a pictorial idea of what we're talking about 
uh, through the previous uh, chapters. For example, <clears throat> an airbag system is an embedded system. So you can really see the evolution. And uh, an airbag system is an embedded system. Then that could be network with other systems, let's say in a, in a car, um, and it provides still within the car boundaries a very comfortable, safer, and advanced, technologically advanced automobile. So up to there, you can, you can see an embedded system, you can see an advanced sort of embedded, embedded system, but what happens when you go beyond that? Well, now, if that car is smart enough to be connected and networked, now that car can interact with the traffic lights and the uh, control of interceptions. And now you have an intelligent transportation system. You can have an intelligent transportation system. That is an example of a cyber physical system. This is not just the electronics. Now you're interacting with people. Your cars are just part of the system. I'll be very complex, but they're just part of the system. So intelligent transportation and intelligent transportation system is an example of a cyber physical system. And then that intelligent transportation system can be part of a smart city. So you have these systems of systems in which they are all cyber physical systems. So you can see that evolution. And you can see, you can certainly see the distinction in complexity without minimizing the complexity of an airbag or a, a car, an automobile, a modern automobile, without minimizing their complexity, but you can see the disruption and the chasm in complexity when you go from a car to a smart transportation system and how that smart transportation system is just one more system in a smart city that had other type of um, our smart systems when it comes to communication, when it comes to government, when it comes to um, energy. So you can see the magnitude, the step up in, in magnitude. And those are the things that we're talking about. So what are the challenges of cyber physical systems? So one main challenge is the merging of computing and communication. So that is clear because that is, is, is a pillar of the technology. The second one, how to use that computation and communication that is going to be deeply embedded and interacting with physical processes to add these new capabilities. How to utilize them and bring these products to, to fruition. Because the benefits are clear. We talked about safer and more efficient systems. Uh, reduce the cost of, of assets. And there lies a realization of these complex systems for uh, the, to provide these new capabilities. The other uh, challenge is that we have to recognize that it builds on top of existing technology that was not necessarily developed with this in mind. But we have to utilize it because there is a huge deployment and infrastructure of technology already, and we're just not going to rip everything out and throw it away. So the challenge here is highlighting that you're going to be using existing legacy technology and you have to make it work to evolve into this one order of magnitude higher com complexity systems. 
And then how are you going to do things, promote, promote the integration, the reuse, the modularity of different subsystems as you put larger systems together. <clears throat> Both classic or going from um, classic embedded systems, which are sort of segregated, to more uh, sort of physical systems that are where everything is connected. How do you do that, recognizing that you're going to need to reuse and modularize subsystems to put it together? You cannot start from zero every time. So we have to go back to what we've been saying about co-design. You have to co-design uh, the cyber part and the physical part in such a way that you end up with the systems of um, or systems as part of your engineering process. But what we can come up with, if, if it's done well, is uh, the utilization of all, all the capacity that is already available and of which more is going to be available of the computation, the networking. And those opportunities, if you tap into the business opportunities that they're going to provide, is a good uh, economic uh, motivation. For example, uh, computers and communication for enabling smart grid technology for smart power management at a national or global scale. And same thing with the transportation network, a smart and connected and efficient. So again, the goal of a society is to become more efficient uh, to use the infrastructure that is there to, and to enhance the infrastructure for the, uh, to enhance the quality of life of the citizens. That's one part. The other one is that we are becoming more conscientious about the environment. And Another opportunity is, while we're doing this, how to use technology to lessen the impact of systems on the environment. So more sustainable design, more sustainable design. So while we're doing this, if we use the technology appropriately, we can build in sustainability and respect for the environment into the systems that we would be designing. Now, some of the requirements for cyber physical systems, they have to have high reliability and predictability. Uh, Normally, embedded systems are already held to some of those standards of high reliability and uh, predictability when you compare with what we call genetic computing or general purpose computing, PC, laptop, etc. Because they are on things that are expected to be reliable, like cars, airplanes. Uh, so, because of all the electronics, for example, in cars, or the electronics have played a key and decisive role in cars becoming safer and more efficient. So, we know how to do that, and we know, we know how to do a great deal already. Now, when you start making the embedded systems more complex and now connecting them, all those expectations and requirements for reliability and predictability are only going to increase. And when you start 
designing these complex systems where, which are immersed in the physical world that include humans, that physical world becomes or is highly um, unpredictable. So how do you deal with that interaction? How do you deal with that interaction? Because that environment is not a control environment. You can say that controlling an, an engine is a control environment. You can model the combustion, you can, you can model a powertrain, but how do you model what's going on in an interception in a, um, in a smart transportation uh, network in a smart city? So it needs to be it needs to be reliable, predictable, and it must be robust, such that when unexpected conditions arrive, the system the system adapts appropriately. So that adaptability that comes from having highly complex hardware and software uh, is going to be very important. It's going to be a requirement. What other requirements are we going to have? Uh, we're going to need that the system and the software engineering people uh, come up with the hardware, but also reliable, reliable software. So no, nothing is 100% reliable. It's just a matter of when it, when it fails. But the thing is, how do you then manage safely failure? How do you fail gracefully? That's going to become important for both hardware and software, rather than, well, just stop working. So those issues need to be thought about. And um, when you uh, tackle those desi this design paths, um, and you are in this complex environment, small deviations can have very uh, unsafe consequences. So the idea of or the redefinition of robustness and reliability for hardware and software, rather than just lasting a long time, we may have to redefine reliability and or robustness in general as how well, what happens, how well we adapt and manage when something, when a failure occurs. A failure being something that we didn't, unpredictable happened. So how do we manage unpredictability? So this is going to um, involve many disciplines. So things like CAD, embedded uh, design, computer architecture, control theory, formal verification for um, modeling, uh, real-time analysis, software engineering, and those are related to the underlying systems engineering and software engineering domains uh, on top of the actual physical domain beyond the, the technology uh, or the electrical computer software engineering domains. And these are very different um, domains. So again, uh, domain experts uh, are going to be very important. Sips, um, system abs abstraction to be able to model the systems is going to become very important. So you can look at things uh, like robustness. So any type of uh, system, you can look at it as a stack. And if you allocate reliability to the different levels of the stack, uh, you can have a reliable system. But then 
what happens when one of the elements in the stack results in being less than reliable? How can you have the adaptability of another component on the stack to compensate with robustness? So things like that. Adding abstraction to the modeling and the design to express things like concurrency. We cannot specify that well in software today. Uh, specify timing and criticality. So in that way, making sure that the cyber part and the electronics part can meet the challenges of the physical, very complex physical world. So again, uh, predictable reliable components is going to be a key, a key requirement for cyber physical system. And the communications as well. A lot of these systems are going to be con connected wirelessly. Wireless links are inherently unreliable because you don't have an actual um, physical connection. So, but that's going to be, most of these things are going to be connected wirelessly. So how to adapt to that uh, if you lose communications? So, uh, software. Software, how do we assess the reliability of software in the sense of working inside a cyber physical system or being part of a, of a um, cyber physical systems? How can you make sure that your software is um, reliable? <clears throat> For example, um, we can say that a, a computer program is reliable in the sense that you know, you typed it that way, it's going to do exactly what the lines are telling it to do in a predict predictable fashion, but that doesn't mean that it's going to work in the system, for example. Uh, the simplest of programs could fail. You could write a program, it compiles, it runs, it does what supposed to do, but when you put it in the system and it interacts with the physical world, it fails because you don't have a computer language where you can take timing into account. You have to test it and then go back and change something. If you have complex software, that is very, it can become unmanageable, it's very inefficient. So we're gonna need new semantics in languages to deal with things like concurrency and timing, because those things are not comprehended in computer languages today. So, but we're going to see that the same way that more and more hardware design has adopted language type of constructs to describe and deal with the complexity of hardware, software is going to start borrowing something from hardware, such as concurrency and timing. So you're going to see more of a fusion of the semantics of how to tackle software and hardware, which is a good thing because then there is going to be a homogeneous way of tackling the problem. So uh, the fact that we don't have that now is what we're calling a failure of abstraction. So we need better abstraction. We're going to talk a lot more about design flows in uh, the next time we meet, but for now, I'm going to uh, stop here, okay? All right.